For those that don't know me, I'm Freda Spira, the Robert L. Soli Curator of Prints and Drawings at the Yale University Art Gallery. And I'm thrilled tonight to be introducing Peter Parshall to this audience at Yale and beyond as part of a week-long workshop for scholars of early modern works on paper at the Yale University Art Gallery, which is sponsored by the Getty Foundation's Paper Project. The workshop gathers together colleagues who focus on European drawings and prints made before 1900 and addresses how we are currently confronting, reassessing, and restructuring our practices in order to bring them into the 21st century. How, how do we make our collections accessible, provocative, and part of a larger multidisciplinary conversations? How can we activate them to drive and shape new conversations? And how has the past years of the pandemic, social unrest, and market uptick in violence, both in the United States and across the world, changed the conversations that we want to have? The workshop provides us the opportunity to focus on and investigate the ways in which shifting methodologies are specifically relevant to early modern works on paper, and to share knowledge, collaborate across institutions, and to move the field forward. Beginning his career as a professor at Reed College and then shifting into a curatorial position at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, Peter has always worked between the two worlds. This has enabled him to be at the forefront of scholarly inquiry, and it makes him the perfect person to speak during this workshop about his current project on the French printmaker Jacques Callot. I also want to mention that Peter has spent his career not only doing his own innovative work in the field, and I will soon list his many celebrated publications and exhibitions, but he's also been a mentor and friend to many of the people that now teach in universities and curate in museums across the globe, including me. He's infinitely generous with his knowledge and is incredibly invested in shepherding the next generations of art historians. And I say generations because I'm already quite old and he's still at it, so it's kind of amazing. To highlight some of his achievements, he has authored canonical texts such as The Renaissance Print, 1470 to 1550 with David Landau, and Origins of European Printmaking, 15th Century Woodcuts and Their Public with Rainer Schoch, which speaks to his um, desire to collaborate. He's also written countless articles and reviews and curated notable exhibitions such as The Unfinished Print, Origins of European Printmaking, The Baroque Woodcut, and The Darker Side of Light. Arts of Privacy, 1850 to 1900. Please join me in extending a warm wel welcome to Peter Parshall. So uh, pretty much most of the people in this room know what we've been up to. And uh, this is part of a project that is quite a bit larger than this. And it gave me an occasion to, to rethink the center of what I hope will be a chapter. Um, uh, and I came to Kahlo not so long ago uh, in, in a related context and it led me to think there was more to it than that. And given the themes of the conference, I decided that I wanted to center on a really big question, uh, which is the role of the media, and see what we could make out of that. Um, it's a speculative paper. Uh, I'm wandering into waters in which I am only barely capable to navigate. And uh, I tell you that up front uh, in anticipation of the question period, uh, but we'll see how it goes. Uh, I hope the, the questions uh, are good and that um, what I have to say is provocative and th there. Print scholars and Reformation historians, but likely nobody else in this room will recognize the bizarre image on the screen it's an engraving by Wenzel von Olmutz, datable to the very end of the 15th century, and it recalls an event that supposedly took place in Rome in the year 1496. A monstrous corpse was recovered from the Tiber River after the waters of a catastrophic flood had finally subsided. The inscription at the top identifies the location as Rome, capital of the world, and shows the cross keys of St. Peter displayed on the banner flying above the Castel Sant'Angelo, a familiar landmark. The monster itself is a hybrid concoction with an equine head above a female torso, one arm ending in a hand and the second in a stump. It has a scaled body and legs, one with a, a bird's claw and the other with a cloven hoof. A dragon-headed tail sprouts from the buttocks. 
Whether this creature was entirely made up or vaguely approximates some report of a drowned animal badly deformed from weeks in the water, we can't possibly say. Discoveries of this sort, often actual mutations, were understood as aberrations of nature and typically deemed to be ominous portents. Reporting them became something of a printing industry, an early form of media event in the trembling approach of the half millennium. As to how Wenzel's monster was meant to be understood, and there are several speculations, we have no sure answer. A quarter century later, this hybrid acquired a name, der Papstesel, the Pope Ass. In 1523, Wenzel's image was retweeted by the propaganda arm of Martin Luther's publishing operation in Wittenberg in a Reformation pamphlet caricaturing the corruptions of the Roman Church. The pamphlet was written by none other than Philip Melanchthon, the premier theologian among Luther's cadre of attack dogs, allegorizing the image in every detail as a portent of the coming of the Antichrist. For present purposes, I nominate this as an early and exemplary instance of what has come to be known as fake news. The tendentious and distorted interpretation of an event actual or purely invented for specific ideological ends. What was initially a case of sensational reporting had morphed into a targeted assault. And uh, I expect you, all, you, all of you know uh, what I mean by fake news and what I don't mean by fake news. It seems fair to assume that the manufacturing of falsehoods for malicious effect is a constant in human societies. But I think that something quite specific happened to what I'll call political discourse after the turn of the, of the 16th century. I refer to a shift in the propagation of falsehoods and slanders that reached critical mass in the rhetorical violence of Martin Luther's campaign against the official church and was responded to in kind. This is arguably where polemical satire as we now understand it was invented and further that its rapid development would not have happened without the ability of printing to disseminate texts and images across a wider audience. Put more directly, modern salacious rhetoric, pamphleteering diatribes, the art of caricature, and the rampant falsification of fact for polemical ends was in considerable part a phenomenon of printing and almost certainly could not have otherwise occurred with such vehemence. Lies have doubtless been around since the origin of language itself, but lies and modernity evolved a special comfort zone that significantly altered the dynamic of social discourse. The modern media have supercharged this largely distasteful and frequently destructive potential with often catastrophic results. A case in point is the Charlie Hebdo incident in which an offensive image was published with the intent to humiliate. It was a violation of simple decency and respect for the beliefs of others and like the violence that followed it, we were taught nothing we did not know before. As art historians, we are often also students of iconoclasm and we know something about the impact certain kinds of images can have. The sociologist Max Weber famously defined the European Enlightenment as bringing about the disenchantment of the world. By this he meant that God was at last removed from his heaven that science had, had supplanted superstition and the authority of knowledge finally prevailed over the attractions of belief. From these premises descended much that is rightly held to be progress, particularly in the realm of science and technology, medical advances, improved means of subsistence and better protection against the elements, most obviously. Other consequences are manifestly on the deficit side the proliferation of authoritarian governments and weapons of mass destruction, for example. And now, of course, the climate crisis, a phenomenon substantially due to modern techniques of energy production in pursuit of our effort to subdue nature to our will. Surrounding all of this is the fact that the world has only become disenchanted in Weber's sense for a small segment of the global population, whereas a very large portion of it continues to resist or remain oblivious of the instructions of science and modern social planning. All of that taken into consideration, 
it is perhaps worth reflecting once again on the, the historical coincidence of the advent of, of printing and the formation of early modern societies in the West. This is of pressing interest because so much of our current socio-political crisis, not to say our disagreements over the distinction between fact and fiction, has been chalked up to the perversion and likewise the perversity of the media, in particular social media, as a, a, a digitally facilitated network for exchange, as a seemingly unprecedented psychosocial ambience, and as commonly argued, an active and determining force in human affairs. The celebration of technology as the true measure of progress, not to say a panacea for all things, uh, has been with us ever since the Industrial Revolution. Joined with the insatiable thirst of capitalism for continuous expansion, we have a bitter coalition of forces to contend with. Climate change, having been effectively propelled by technology, can probably only be mitigated by technology, the very factor that delivered us into this situation. I say these things that you already know only to make the point that the role of technology in human affairs is an ever more vital and uncertain factor in our day, and that the history of printing, now regarded as quaint, not to say archaic, offers us an arena for considering these things at a distance. The Renaissance famously proclaimed printing along with gunpowder and the magnetic compass, to be the three most consequential instruments to be acquired in its time, a judgment that quickly proved to be accurate. But does this fact also argue for some kind of technological determinism? It's tempting to conclude that the answer to this question might be yes. Effective technologies, whether for violent or peaceful purposes, may be superseded, but they do not disappear once they've been introduced. That is to say, Short of the complete collapse of a civilization, a technical invention is here for good. The question of technological determinism has routinely been a matter of discussion in the history of printing. To get a sense of this, one need only consider the ongoing responses to Elizabeth Eisenstein's 1979 book, The Printing Press as an Agent of Change. Her use of the term agency, provoked in part by Marshall McLuhan's writings, from which she diverged, led many commentators to question its causal implications. Eisenstein herself was alert to this issue, including the methodological implications of agency. She modestly offers her history as a synthesis of related phenomena rather than a thesis about the engines of historical change. And although her lengthy two-volume study is in a general way comprehensive, it is also often untethered where problems of cause and effect are concerned. Thus, her claims for agency are far from insistent and not expressly suggestive of technical determinism. Closer to the mark is William Ivan's provocative and still widely read book, Prints and Visual Communication, published in 1954 in the wake of World War II, and at the height of respect for what technology had and could accomplish for humankind. Ivans was very much taken with the importance of printmaking for the progress of science and technology, both of which he saw as dependent on replicable imagery for their achievements and their limitations, what printed pictures could convey and what they could not. It took decades for this aspect of replicated imagery to be taken up again in a serious way, now it has been, most notably, in the work of Lorraine Daston and Peter Gallison, although their, their concerns have less to do with the agency of replication itself and more with the accurate uh, record of keeping, uh, with, with accurate record keeping and the evolution of scientific method. I have generally been reluctant to grant agency to an apparatus such as a printing press, a machine that was, after all, designed and employed by human beings for, the, for ends that were determined by human beings. Save the lunatic contraptions of Rube Goldberg, inventions tend to be created when the need for them arises, not the other way around. Furthermore, replication by impression was an ancient technology that had existed in related forms for millennia and only achieved success as a replicator of images when the circumstances for its usefulness were propitious. 
Otherwise, why would it be that all three of the touted discoveries of the Renaissance were known in China long before they came to the West and yet without comparable effect? Determination is the business of individuals and societies, not presses and navigational maps or firearms. On the other hand, despite the number of beneficial technologies that have evolved from military research, are we quite sure that once a pistol has been invented and put on the table, there is not some inevitability to its malicious use? Should we consider, for example, whether a widely available, inexpensive means of trumpeting one's views will inexorably lead to a deterioration of language and a degeneration of socially redeeming content? I refer once again to our opening example of the satirical print. Is it highly, like, highly likely, if not inevitable, that a medium of wider communication will seek out its most abject idiom and that a firearm will eventually find its most destructive employment? Stephen Hawking once observed that the computer virus could be considered the first new life form to be invented entirely through human agency and further that we should take seriously the fact that this life form is purely destructive. And now artificial intelligence is suspected to be a lead candidate for unintended cat catastrophe by design. A change of scene. <laughs> With these questions in mind, I, I would now like to investigate further the idea that printmaking may indeed have been a subtle but significant shaper of the modern world. What I propose is a kind of thought experiment regarding the work of the early 17th century etcher Jacques Callot, unusually a court artist specializing exclusively in printmaking. I want to consider whether the art of, a, of the print can be implicated in helping to shape a culture of political absolutism. I mean to suggest that in Callot's hands, the print became not only an embodiment, but a definer of the objectives of the state that his style of etching became not so much an agent of change as the formulation of a language of comportment and a refined scheme of social classification that conformed to the aspirations and reinforced the claims of the early modern state. And finally, that this accomplishment had as much to do with the inherent definitiveness and authority of the printed image as with the content of Callow's art. I will then conclude with a coda concerning a much later state-sponsored project with much more explicit imperial objectives. Jacques' father, a minor aristocrat, arranged court festivals for the Duchy of Lorraine, which suggests that Jacques was in a sense born to his role. The choice of printmaking was nonetheless surprising for someone with Callot's lineage. He must have shown exceptional talent in draftsmanship and perhaps also a canny sense of where the future of our future opportunities lay to have chosen this career over something more prestigious like portrait painting. In any event, immediately after he entered court service, the depiction of elaborately staged court spectacles became part of Jacques' duty roster. After a brief apprenticeship in Rome, Callo moved to the court of Cosimo II de Medici in Florence, arguably the most culturally and scientifically advanced center of learning at the time, and a model of the autocratic state. Meanwhile, under Medici patronage, the Italian theater was experiencing major changes, a development spearheaded by Callo's supervisor and mentor, Giulio Parigi, an, an engineer and draftsman credited with revolutionizing <clears throat> Baroque theater design. The Medici were renowned for the display of princely magnificence through theatrical staging and performance. Medici patronage also extended to Galileo, whose Siderius Nuncius, published in 1610 and dedicated to Cosimo, conveyed the results of his telescopic observations of our moon and the moons of Jupiter, helping to confirm, as, as they did, the Copernican case for removing the Earth from the center of the universe Galileo got into serious trouble with the papacy, thus putting him in, in need of protection. The Medici provided him refuge and entrusted him with the education of Cosimo's son and successor, Fernando. Galileo's official position as advisor to the Duke began on the eve of Calo's arrival. 
However much or little the artist had to do with the inner circle of scientists, engineers, and mathematicians at court, it was a heady milieu to be around. The grand spectacles of the Medici court were Calo's most important, were Calo's most important assignments, and he cultivated a slick theatrical manner of representing them. Among his most celebrated skills was an ability to compose hundreds of figures, all of them legible, strewn across a vast seeming space. Callot's figure style, his capacity to transform the costumed human form into a balletic cipher of effortless grace and comportment, reflects the obvious correlation between theatrical affect and the rituals of the court that was in every respect promoted in his prints. These were images of a society of grand gestures, of effete performances of, of domination and deference meant to disguise a culture of power and deceit. It was Callot's brilliance to transform style into an illusion of substance through a language of display in which deceit extends even to his graphic technique where the facility of etching feigns the authority of an engraving style. Whether purposely or subconsciously, he was synthesizing an art of the state. My point of reference here is a study by James C. Scott, a longtime professor of anthropology and political science at this university, and the author of a critique of the modern state titled Seeing Like a State. As Scott points out, the most basic requirements for the success of an absolutist government are matters of organization, introducing certain uniformities that make possible the oversight and control of territory. These include, for example, a census of the population, cadastral maps dividing the land for taxation, a uniform system of measurement, a standardized currency, a military employed by the state rather than hired mercenaries, and a bureaucracy sufficient to supervise these measures. Such were the steps beginning to be undertaken by the emerging European nation states of the 17th century when and where Kahlo stood on the ground floor with an elevated point of view. If we were to imagine an, an artistic manifestation of the state in action, it might look something like the image on the screen. Among Callot's most famous compositions, this is a printed fan of a size uh, to be held lightly in the hand. In fact, 500 of these fans were initially printed and pasted onto supports to be issued as party favors for the event represented on it, along with a thousand printed pamphlets explaining the allegory. The scene itself is minutely etched with an elaborate ornamental surround that serves doubly as a, a perch for spectators and a proscenium arch framing a mock naval battle that was actually staged between two bridges on the Arno River, the profile of Florence visible beyond. The date and place of the event are inscribed on the banner above, which also announces the parties to the contest, the Florentine cloth guilds of weavers against the dyers. Sailing vessels and oared barges attacking floating islands exploding with fireworks suggest the breathtaking extravagance of these pageants. The little levity of the, of the fan, an example being waved by a figure uh, on the right side of the ledge, which is there. Um, Throws up, throws up a reassuring veil of peace and prosperity in an unstable world. As Scott points out elsewhere, a predilection for modeling and miniaturization is essential to the self-conception of the state. Quote, constructing a micro order designed in large part to mesmerize rulers through self-hypnosis and the larger public with a Potemkin facade of centralized order. Unquote. In other words, to create the illusion of dominance on the scale of toy soldiers on a tabletop, to be offered a part of the world in a beautifully choreographed little flea circus, such as this surely does the trick. The vitality of Kahlo's figure style and his landscapes is rooted in the late Mannerist art of the 16th century, particularly in France. Skirting the effete androgyny of his countryman and predecessor, Jacques Ballange, and declining the staid factuality of his acquaintance, Abraham Boss. Callot sought an ambience of courtly savoir faire in line with what John Shearman has characterized as the stylish style. 
Accordingly, his cavaliers became the prototype for the sporty gallants of Alexandre Dumas, and for good reason. The figure style itself, with its histrionic flourishes and panache, must have perfectly conveyed an image of effortless bearing and affectation well suited to a culture of princely magnificence. Kahlo's art is, in its essence, a theatrical mode executed with consummate virtuosity. Indeed, apart from thumbnail sketches, I would venture there is scant evidence that he routinely drew from life in composing a finished work. Rather, Kahlo synthesized a language of postures and expressions that became his own, while being at the same time supremely accessible, widely imitated, and voraciously collected. It was a brand that we might retrospectively call the Cavalier style a formula codified and fluent in its nuances and adaptable to all the subjects he chose to portray. Kahlo's depictions in the courtly manner are but one dimension of his repertoire. The theater, for example, became a matter of interest in several respects, often shading into satire and the grotesque. A, lud a ludic commentary on the pretensions of the courtier seemed to underlie the depictions of street actors, usually figures from the Commedia dell'arte, with their comic plots built on cuckoldry, quackery, and general silliness. One could argue that, like Carnival, these satires served to reassure the privileged, that, and the, the privileged and aspiring that they were none of these things. As a social cataloger, Callot is the true successor to Peter Bruegel the Elder, whose prints he must have known well. But unlike Bruegel, he singled out individual social types for portrayal, sometimes in series, and notably beggars and itinerants, such as the Romani. In his vision, the preferred, the merely condoned, and the denigrated coalesced into a synthesized fantasy of an orderly community. Like Bruegel, Callow was not so much a reporter as an improvisational observer, and in his best-known work, The Fair at Impruneta, he formulated for his patron a consummate and colorful account of a prospering society. Like Bruegel before him, he perpetuated but, subdu but subdued the formula of the raised foreground and elevated horizon as a strategy for surveying a crowd. The Fair at Impruneta, is a complex work with a dense repertoire of characters and vignettes bearing a variety of subtexts, encyclopedic in scope. Call it a vision of the human comedy, allusions to Dante and Balzac intended. A large plate, more than two feet across, the fair has famously been tallied at well over a thousand figures. More than 200 sketches and several composition designs indicate that Kahlo was painstaking in his preparations. His preliminary studies are largely notational, like a stenographer's shorthand, suggesting that he probably did visit the fair in its season, and in some respect recorded what he saw. Although the suggestion that Kahlo's festival image is a documentary made in situ, situ is no doubt wishful delusion. The content of the printed image comprises an inventory of everything we would want to find in such a setting. Vendors at their business, actors performing, scrapping children, snake handlers, revelers, drunken brawlers, farm animals, as well as casual visitors and busy shoppers from across the social spectrum. Such annual fairs were a great stimulus to local economies and drew merchants from all over the region doing the circuit. The print is dedicated to Cosimo de' Medici in a lavish inscription, noting that the bustling trade fair is held annually on the feast day of St. Luke before the renowned church dedicated to the miraculous Virgin of Impruneta, a sacred icon, quote, painted, it is said, by St. Luke himself and discovered hidden among the thorn bushes and now enshrined and worshiped with the utmost reverence, unquote. Here two things are commemorated equally the commercial event and the image of the miracle working virgin, for centuries a celebrated cult figure and protector of Florence. The Virgin of Impruneta was routinely called upon as a rainmaker and a guardian against the plague. Some of you will know Richard Trexler's important study of the Impruneta cult and its intimate relation to the Florentine demos, where it served as a guarantor of, a well, of well-being and a focus of communal solidarity in times of stress. On October 18th, the feast day of St. Luke, 
and in times of peril, the precious icon was carried some eight miles to visit Florence and its major churches. Here it appears that the icon has just returned home, for we can make out the canopied cart now empty and the hooded members of the confraternity of penitents who accompany it uh, beginning to break up. And you can see that just here. Set against one of Bruegel's village fairs, also on a saint's day, the differences are striking. The festival of St. George, the Bruegel, is not predominantly interpreted as a commercial event, but a seasonal celebration of theater, dancing, feasting, contests of skill, and brawling. Bruegel's festival begins, uh, belongs to the peasants and also in includes the processing of a statue of a saint, but unlike the Impruneta, it illustrates a conflict between rather than an integration of religious and civic life. Callot, by contrast, makes a point of inclusion, not just in the variety of activities, but incorporating some of the disruption that we find in the Bruegel, bar fights, quacks, and the crippled. But predominantly, it is an inclusive image of the local population. Pilgrims, vendors, and buyers from different social classes, men and women of all ages, spectators and gentlefolk out for the day in the country. On sale are sausages and drinks, bolts of cloth in abundance, hats and other garments. There are pop-up taverns and pick-up card games. Save the corrupt merchant hoisted on the strapato, even the poor and disadvantaged are treated generously and at peace. On the left, a more elegant display of fine vessels at a stall offering drink along with fancy wares and a clientele to match. In a further nod to Bruegel, <clears throat> at the center of the composition are two dogs coupling, reminding us that Kahlo was not lacking in crass humor. Like his etching of the fan, the fair proposes an account of what a mixed gathering might look like, quite literally, to the elevated observer. The anecdotal construction of the scene is conventional, but also more in the vein of an integrated local census than a picture such as Bruegel's of village release bordering on riot. Callot's is, is an image of a society capable of being governed. Indeed, the fair at Impruneta won the artist a gold chain bearing the portrait of the Duke, a notable accomplishment for the dedication of a mere print depicting a popular event such as this. <clears throat> it seems that Cosimo was proud of his vision of, of comedy under rule. As the dedicatory inscription makes clear, the occasion of the fair draws together the commercial vitality of the Duchy of Florence and the chief cult figure that underwrote it, its protection against catastrophe. The credit for these benefits is granted to the Medici family who ruled Tuscany almost continuously for nearly two centuries. It is an image of enlightened leadership, something like a theater of well-being, a fictional version of a reality show unveiling in microcosm the prosperities, pieties, temptations, and simple pleasures of, of the world in which symptoms of discord are mainly restricted to rambunctiousness and recalcitrant mules unhappy with their loads. In, this encyclopedic accounting of the contemporary population <coughs> was hardly exclusive to Callot. It is rather a proclivity of the time. Abraham Boss's survey of the trades and his, stri and his striving to gain respect for the mechanical arts reflect an interest in classification on an increasingly capitalized bourgeois culture where skill and wealth were the means to social mobility. Kahlo's service in the paradise of the Medici court terminated sharp sharply in 1621 with the death of Cosimo II and Kahlo's return to his hometown at, of Nancy. He was now a noted figure and fit to marry well and launched an independent career by making copies of his most successful plates from his final years in Florence, as well as undertaking series of his own. With a reputation and connections, he became available for commissions. The Duchy of Lorraine, positioned at, at the pivot of France and Span the Spanish Netherlands and R the Rhineland, wielded an influence well above its weight. 
Like the Medici, this was an aristocracy that laid claim to an, unlike the Medici, this was an aristocracy that laid claim to an ancient bloodline and was likewise, likewise dynastically well connected. Whatever Kahlo's private allegiances may have been, this was his home. It's worth noting that his investment in social cataloging only accelerated with his departure from Florence, which suggests that he perceived a much wider European audience for the, the, this repertoire of imagery. Kahlo had a canny sense of his public and should be counted as the most imitated and, and extensively collected printmaker of his time. And Boss is, uh, is a, an, an immediate follow-up to that and, and expresses very explicitly this interest in, in categorization. Shortly after returning to Nancy, Callot received what was likely his most lucrative commission, this from the Habsburg court in Spain. The project was for a monumental overview of the siege of the Dutch town of Breda by the Spanish army in 1624 and was likely awarded him because of Giovanni Cantagallina, a military engineer and perspectivist who had worked with Callo at the Medici court. Giovanni later helped plan the Spanish siege and subsequently consulted with Callo on its recreation in print four years later. That commission would soon be followed by two other siege maps of comparable scale for the court of Louis XIII of France, both completed in the early 1630s. These projects represent Callot's engagement with two of the most powerful absolute estates, the first surviving on gold and silver and the, from the New World and the second in its ascendancy as a major land power in continental Europe. These siege landscapes are the culmination of Kahlo's achievement in restaging the grand schemes of the imperial state as glorious propaganda, all three of them carried out in the very midst of the Thirty Years' War. Kahlo's mural siege maps explode the convention of the lofty overview on a spectacular scale for a composition of intaglio prints. The example on the screen with its surrounding texts measures about four by nine feet Ste stepping up to the frame, we are given a launching point from which to soar above the landscape that plunges away beneath us before rising again to a lofty horizon. A radicalized version of the Bruegelian so-called world landscape, a concept I still can't get my head around, Kahlo has created an aerial view that seamlessly incorporates a map of the walled town of Breda at its center. This spatial contrivance makes no secret of its artificiality. It is a vertiginous parabolic space that despite the compass and the ruled scale supplied at the lower left margin could not have been plotted by standard perspectival means or measured according to its proportions. The canal on the left margin cascading down the slope like a giant water slide belies the actual topography of the area a level plain never more than four meters above sea level. Composed on six large plates, this graphic recreation of the siege itself is episodic, temporally dispersed and diagnostic. Scattered around the map are the locations of besieging troops, constituencies identified by their captains or country of origin, then cannon emplacements, fortifications and skirmishes all keyed by letters on the map to the legends on the margins. Also recorded are the supporting cast of camp followers, including kitchens and laundries, a makeshift tavern and a brothel. Major events such as the celebrated appearance of Callow's patroness Isabella and her train, prominent on the right, and above the evacuation of the town garrison and its, its surviving population, not visible on the slide. These episodes span many months. Estimates of the size of the besieging army run as high as 70,000, including replacement forces held in reserve and outlying companies guarding supply lines and protecting against attempts to lift the siege. In Kahlo's time, siege warfare had come to, to be seen as the most civilized form of military conflict and an example of how modern warfare should be conducted. By all accounts, the siege of Breda was in fact exemplary of such campaigns, and the clemency afforded the inhabitants of the town sent to, seemed to be the height of, of martial etiquette. This is precisely the claim that Velasquez's famous painting of around 1635 is meant to celebrate. 
and yet the facts point to another conclusion. Sieges were wars of attrition and almost always successful. Absent an enemy force sufficient to lift a siege, it was entirely a matter of resources, principally food and water that would determine the outcome. The statistics at Breda, more or less confirmed by a detailed contemporary account accompanying the map, record the loss of roughly one third of the town, some 3,000 troops and 13,000 non-combatants dead. The statistics were worse for the sieges recorded in Kahlo's two other commissions. Given these celebratory comm commemorations, the siege map and the Velasquez, the misery of, at Breda would seem to be Spain's most proclaimed victory in a war it finally lost. Kahlo's fabrication of military theater on behalf of the state can be taken as exemplifying an art of hegemony. The perspective through which he quite literally unrolls this exhilarating survey is in its mathematical fantasy an imagined world. Kahlo's training in perspective geometry took place in a period obsessed with the subject and particularly among architects and military engineers who were working on its frontiers. Indeed, the French in particular were on the verge of a fundamental reconsideration of perspectival geometry. In the midst of this was the elusive figure of Girard des Argues, whose geometric theories drew the attention of Leibniz, Descartes, and Pascal. Although the evidence appears to be difficult to interpret, des Argues seems to have in invented the field of projective geometry, a post-Euclidean way of configuring constructed space that abandons the single viewpoint in favor of a sort of floating perspective in constructions entailing two or more vanishing points that position the viewer within the fictive space rather than standing apart from it. This is how Hubert Damisch, citing the French philosopher Michel Serre, describes it. Quote, Euclidean geometry posits a homogeneous space in which all points are equivalent. The geometry of Des Argues, by contrast, posits a space in which the point encompasses space and space encompasses the point. The word encompasses being understood to, in, to embrace not only geometry, but vision and thought as well." Unquote. Or put reductively, it is a scheme that puts us in, not in front of the space depicted. Callot's plunging siege scapes seem to have this effect. And if they, if they are a direct response to current developments in projective geometry, then they are literally on the crest of a wave. Des Argues theory, uh, theories were first published in, only in 1635, shortly after this. One of the last two, uh, th this that you're looking at, one of the last two of Callot's siege prints. It is more reasonable, oops, not so. Blew my cover there. Um, Excuse me. It is more reasonable and, and indeed more interesting, I think, to imagine a conceptual, even phenomenological drift taking place among the efforts of mathematicians, military engineers, and optical theorists, and that their thinking was allied at some level with an artist engaged in the reconception of stage design. Moreover, as Damish implies, the uncertainty of viewpoint may also apply to moral judgments. As Blaise Pascal observed, quote, looking at pictures which are too near or too far away, there is just one indivisible point, which is the right place in painting the rules of perspective decided. But how will it be decided when it comes to truth and morality, unquote. One thing we can say for certain is that Callot's siege prints have no single vanishing point. I have not considered those moments in Kahlo's art that seem to express opinions contrary to those of his patrons, most notably the critique of warfare concealed in his influential cycle, The Miseries and Misfortunes of War, published in Paris in 1633 in the wake of his commissions for the French crown. With few exceptions, Kahlo appears to be pretty much an effortless servant of the absolutist regimes that employed him what role, if any, can we assign to the printed medium itself in the conduct of, uh, conduct of the state other than the obvious advantage it provided political institutions to promote themselves? We might usefully rephrase that question to something like this. 
When and how does a partisan coalition or a state absorb the instrumentalities of a medium to further its own ends, and to what extent do the client and the instrument instruct one another? As a brief coda to our discussion thus far, I would like to consider a very different example of printing in service to an absolutist agenda. The grand Napoleonic project titled The Description of Egypt, among the most remarkable achievements in the entire history of printing. This was a publication that took nearly 20 years to complete and includes 23 volumes, folio volumes of commentary and illustrations incorporating more than 900 plates and over 3,000 images. It was a project planned from the outset as part of France's invasion of Egypt in 1798, a campaign that maintained a staff of more than 150 so-called Orientalists as well as artists, architects, archeologists, geologists, astronomers, botanists, and zoologists designa designated in good enlightenment fashion as the savants. These people were deployed throughout the country to record ancient monuments and artifacts, as well as the routines of modern life and natural history. Thousands of drawings were eventually brought back to Paris in 1801 and sifted by a large oversight committee before being turned over to a staff of printmakers whose proofs were screened for quality before and during the printing. This was the last and most Ozymandian undertaking in a long history of antiquarian catalogs, beginning with Raphael's survey of ancient Rome, and given the, the conditions of a hostile campaign and the harsh climate, it was a plan of unbelievable ambition. Among those savants was Jacques Conté, now best known as the inventor of the pencil, and in Napoleon's expedition, given a day job as a, a commander of the balloon corps. After returning to Paris, he joined the publication's supervisors and, and invented an engraving machine fitted with, an, with interchangeable cams to inscribe the varying patterns for the skies, an innovation said to reduce eight months of labor to a matter of days. The panel above appears in the, in the description, and it's a, uh, an, an example of the, the, the many variations of pattern that you can, you can produce through the, the use of these cams. The style throughout the corpus is cool, austere, and lucid, a natural idiom for, the transmit, for transmitting information and well suited to the printed image. The ancient structures were most often shown reconstituted, sometimes with ground plans and cutaway views and other times in ruins. The description was unprecedented in, as a pictorial survey and given that a tightly consistent standard of design was maintained over two decades, three directors and across many dozens of artists and technicians, it is an astonishing achievement. The illustrations of contemporary life more closely approach the picturesque and pay close attention to the means of living, farming, cattle raising, irrigation, artisanry, musical instruments, costume, and so forth. The entire project was funded by the state and as a monument to neoclassical taste, submits a material culture long deemed to be mysterious and remote to the discipline of a Greco-Roman aesthetic. It is an exemplary act of hegemonic appropriation. As Edward Said observed, this expedition, quote, was the very model of a truly scientific appropriation of one culture by another. Its great collective monument of erudition, the description of Egypt, provided the setting for Orientalism, unquote. The historical coalescence of printing with the absolutist state is to a considerable degree self-evident. What to make of that dynamic is the question. On the one hand, I propose that we consider the relationship to be more than simply the adoption of a medium for its convenience as an enabler of the objectives of the modern state. But then do we go on to propose that the medium itself had agency in this relationship? that it played a role in shaping the objectives of the state. 
It seems that we as a society may now be coming to such a conclusion regarding the impact of social media in the present day. Does this realization also find precedent in the past? Returning to the historical question, we might think of printing as a sort of container for the propagation and self-realization of the state, a container with certain possibilities and certain limitations that is not so much determined as co-shepherded the ways in which the state came to define itself and its public. Printing, like theater, became a medium through which the state spoke to itself and to its polity, and through which the polity responded. It was a framework for exchange, but also one for un ungoverned polemic propaganda and subversion, sometimes for good and sometimes not. In these respects, printing foreshadowed the digital age in which we now live and work, and like the force of gravity, once it, once it is recognized, it is hard to imagine a world without it. Thank you. How do you see this um, in the tradition of Emperor Maximilian and his uh, large printed uh, efforts? Well, it's, a, it's, it's an obvious precedent, no question about it. Uh, as a, a kind of self-congratulatory propaganda campaign, it's striking uh, how quickly prints were incorporated into state interests. Uh, and so what in interests me um, is not the last, the last medieval knight, but the first capitalist emperor. And uh, therefore, I, what I'm interested in seeing here is a shift in the use of the print on both sides, that is to say, uh, on the popular side as a, an avenue for salacious rhetoric, uh, and on the, the, let's say, institutional side, uh, a, a way of, of furthering your program in, in a manner that mu is much subtler than what you see, I think, in, uh, in the case of Maximilian, which is sort of straightforwardly rebuilding a, a tradition for an empire that he wants to stay that way. This is a dynamic business that's going on, I think, here. Thanks for a, a, a really sort of panoramic <laughs> lecture in, in so many ways. Um, could you elaborate a little bit on something that you uh, alluded to sort of obliquely, which is the Galileo circle um, and Callow's putative connection to it or not? And, and I asked the question in relation to technologies, uh, agencies, and state formation, because mm -hmm. of course the telescope is used in exactly that way uh, by the Medici, or by Galileo for the Medici, in terms of the naming of the Medicean stars. Right. So, do you see? Do you do you see? I'm not, I'm not suggesting there's any kind of causal connection to to what Callow is doing, but do you see that as a parallel, as something comparable to what is happening um, in uh, in printing? Well, craftsmen, and there's a sense in which Galileo was a craftsman as well. Um, were for hire, uh, and you know we know that this is a period where you should be very careful about ascribing uh, the content of uh, an object uh, to the author of it. Um, Galileo's naming of the the moons of Jupiter, the Medici stars, uh, was an outright response to the patronage he received, which was was uh, absolutely critical to the future of his career. As he, he, he extricated him from his himself from his responsibility in Venice uh, and got himself in a position where he was, he was immune to uh, arrest and incarceration, at least initially, uh, from the, by, the, by the papacy. Uh, and that allowed him to continue his work, which the Medici stood behind. So that seems like um, a good example of a, a, a foresightful court uh, recognizing the gain of prestige in providing these possibilities to a scientist 
uh, and setting aside the, the religious complications that, that um, uh, would, have, would have hindered him elsewhere. Um, I, I suppose there's a, a tempting way in which one could think of assigning portions of the universe to yourself uh, is comparable to uh, creating an entire theatrical world that is really um, some kind of metaphor for the state that you oversee. But I guess, I guess I want to see printing as a much larger phenomenon than that, uh, simply because of, of its potential for mass distribution, for, for um, adoption by all corners of society's difficulty in, in uh, governing, but also its value as um, the propagation of a myth of the state, uh, as was true, as Nadine suggested, of Maximilian. But I think we're dealing here with um, something that is much closer to mesmerizing a population and indeed the courts of Europe. Peter, to some extent, a theatrical spectacle trades on novelty. And I'm wondering, um, with regard to the spectacle of the siege, or at least the spectacle he's recording, um, whether there was anything novel about the engineering of that siege. I especially, I mean, he was collaborating with, uh, what was that, is it Cantagallina? Cantagallina, yeah, Cantagallina. whose brother was a draftsman who, uh, who we met early and, and was also at the court. So is there anything novel about the engineering of the siege? Or is it simply that he wants to show us that the state is able to coordinate its forces in an entirely conventional way? Um, th that, uh, but uh, well, there are two things here. One is the image of the siege, and the other is the siege itself. Uh, Cantigalina, among others, including people like Descartes, and they were also involved in, in designing sieges. Uh, everybody was pretty much uh, guilty in that domain, um, people that we think of in quite, quite different ways. Um, th those were practical matters. They had to do with uh, knowledge of canon, canon trajectories and with plotting out potential courses of escape and, and, and uh, supply with positioning troops all over the place, figuring out in detail the terrain and so on. It was a, it was a, a huge business and involved many people in gigantic numbers of, of troops. Um, so it's a spectacular accomplishment just from the point of view of organization and it all needed to be done carefully in advance. Uh, because you know you had you, you moved in, you blocked off all access to it. You, ban you dug your trenches and set up cannon emplacements and positioned groups of troops around and so on. It had to happen quickly and it had to stay, it had to be sustainable for a long period of time. That's that's the the, the engineering part. It's just a, a gigantic piece of of uh, as it were city planning. And um, the but what I'm talking about uh, is how you image that. And what sort of implications do you uh, supply to your account of it uh, that are indicative? And um, so there's, there's this other question of, of the space. I'm making, I'm making a lot out of the extraordinariness of the way in which he conceives the space and kind of underscores it by including things like, uh, like uh, measurement uh, panels and so forth that, don't really apply. Um, he he is creating a theater, in the in the literal sense. Uh, it's it is also an uh, a, an account of a military action, the, the 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 details of which are confirmed by elaborate you know descriptions. Uh, but primarily, what he's doing is presenting a vision. I mean, this is my argument that these are not just sort of exaggerations of a convention that you, we can trace back a hundred years. This is uh, an idea about a martial landscape and what it, it, the experience of it uh, can be like if you wish to produce it as um, uh, an extravagance of um, military achievement and uh, pull people in, literally, and it's a fantasy, 
And that, it's, that, it's this, this is the dynamic that most interests me in all of this. The, the question of the math, I'm, I'm just simply not competent to make a judgment about, but, but uh, the phenomenon of projective, geography, uh, projective geometry has been discussed by many people, and there's a very good account of it um, in Martin Kemp's book on art and science. Ivan's uh, goes into great detail about it um, in his book on art and geometry. There are many, many discussions of it. And um, I, can, uh, I can sort of get a gestalt of what they're really talking about. And it's fascinating, but I certainly can't reproduce it mathematically. And I'm not sure anybody can. That is to say that, that Desarg himself, his writings and so on are difficult. But Boss published them. I mean, this was a very tight connection. Boss published Desargues writings and illustrated them. So, you know, it's interesting when you see how intimate the relationship was between just, for example, the military and art. I mean, we've known that for a long time. The artists were building fortifications and so on. But this is another level of sophistication. How much Kahlo knew about the math behind perspective projection, I'm not really sure. Uh, but he was in a milieu that was completely absorbed by it. It's a, co it's a coincidence on the one hand, but the, the circumstantial evidence is kind of amazing. Thank you, Peter. Um, the siege of Breda seems to be a pretty orderly siege. And indeed, it has what seem to be phalanxes, which is a kind yeah. of novel orderly ordination of troops, which was just being written about and proposed by people like Lipsius at the time. But yeah. But be, beyond that, I, I'm not sure what I, I, I see the problem of agency. If you deny agency to objects, it doesn't have to be the sole determinant, but it can be a factor in well, influencing a public for a point of view. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm not trying to accuse uh, the medium of the print with um, modern atrocity. Uh, the, the, to say the siege is orderly, you're, what you're looking at is an image of many months that has to be captured in it. This is a this is a, this is not a, sequ a sequence. So um, the, these are all examples of stations of places and throughout and skirmishes over here and other things over there and uh, early events such as visits by the Polish king and, and and later events such as the evacuation of the town after the treaty had been concluded. These are all in it. So the orderliness is just a reflection of the fact uh, that he's, he's supplying the details, and also that it was nothing but sitting for most of the time. That's precisely the point, and that's how he's presenting it. Yeah. I mean, it has agency in that it takes a very complex, multifaceted phenomenon and presents it in a way that's very flattering to the Habsburgs, who... Right. So yeah. I'm just saying that what I wonder about is your trouble with agency at the beginning of your lecture. Mm -hmm. That I think if you deny objects agency, you're left saying guns don't kill people, people kill people. I'm trying to push the agency question further than that uh, and say that w without the medium of printing, which is, you know, to, to call it a technology even is a, is a, a bit flattering. I mean, it's kind of a technology on the level of a plow. Uh, I mean, it's not a supercomputer that we're talking about here. But, but the effect of it, um, so far as the availability of texts and images across Europe and the potential for use for communication of all kinds was obvious, I think, to all of us. Uh, but does that mean that it affects the future? That's the point. And, and not only, by effects I mean actually shapes it. Recording something is not shaping. So thank you for a, 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 an incredibly stimulating talk in terms of the larger trajectory that you've laid out for us. And um, I thought that there was something that you brought to the fore, this is just first a comment, which was the that there's something that's instrumental about the prints that Kello is doing. So there's the, the way the fan is something that's held and that is something that you're looking closely at and through something. And then the way that the Siege of Breda is something where you're actually um, moving to the detail and to the, to, the, um, to the legend and going back and forth. So there's a kind of um, an insistent implication that somebody engage with it. And I, I think there, there must be something about that kind of performative involvement. In particular, I was struck by the fact that so many of these are, 
are battle scenes or scenes which are about kind of conflict and thinking about how mm -hmm. that works. So I think that's something that's, that you implied that's really um, important and somehow very different from the second example. But I was also really struck by what you said about Kello having um, kind of made an effort to have types rather than something mm -hmm. which is naturalistic. And there is something so much about the almost the kind of calligraphic gesture of the of the bodies. And, mm -hmm. um, and so how those types work compared to when you have something which is hi, uh, kind of highly naturalistic, as in the second example, I'm just wondering what the role is of the kind of graphic line that is about a type versus something that then becomes about kind of insisting that we're we're being convinced by the realism of, of the image kind of in this larger discussion, obviously thinking about AI as the kind of like where you're going. Right. Um, I, uh, I, I want to back away from the word realism because I, what I'm really talking about is theater. Um, and of course you can have realistic theater, but I'm talking really about building, building a, a fantasy. Uh, and um, essentially a cover-up of realities that are not present um, in order to make a state governable. Um, the, he, he, has, he has types, he, he has a figure type. Uh, he is an extraordinarily fluid draftsman. Uh, his figures are, are marvelously uh, adaptable and so on, and then there's, but, but the real categorization that I meant to, to focus on was social categorization, that the classification of types is very different from, from what happens in Bruegel, and this is a, this is a, a reflection of um, a major change in the way uh, power perceives its, its constituency uh, that I don't think has really been played out enough. It's sort of, oh well, you know, we're describing costumes and we're describing, you know, series of costumes and series of beggars and so on and so forth, a series of soldiers. Um, the series ha has implications that fit remarkably with uh, the advance of organized society under central governance. And that's, that's really my aim. 